right, so let's go back to, I don't want to spend the whole time today on this, this card flipping thing um, because, you know, we could spend the whole rest of the semester on it. Um, but what I did want to make a um, uh, talk a little bit about was, uh, you remember how we were having the issue with the, uh, the game state and the button pressing where it would basically, you hit A and you think you're only hitting it once, but it's kind of actually spamming it. Um, so there's a pretty easy way that we can fix this, um, namely um, the, uh, if we plop this back in, e, let's see, I think we want to plop it back in, and I want to put this in, um, well, okay, so what we could do is say, um, the uh, uh, right here where we've got the conditional uh, statement for if the button is pressed, we could say if the button is pressed and the card that we're overlapping is in state zero. Because what is the action if that's uh, true, what happens? The card state would get set to one. So if we are holding the A button, the very first instance that it registers it being pressed, it sets the card state to one and not zero, and then any subsequent trigger of the A is not going to actually do anything, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah, now, of course, we had some other card states and game states, so we could mix that into it, but point being, right, like we can make sure that we're not going to be able to spam the button. Uh, and I, I think actually, didn't we have, um, we sort of ran into something similar like this when we were doing the side scroller with the jumping, right? So when we were talking about how could you make it so that you couldn't just spam the jump button and float. Um, and there were a couple of different solutions that we had to that. One was the, um, the there was the built-in gravity jump function which sort of prevented that. Uh, but then also we sort of said how we could do like, where you could enable a double jump, but not anything beyond that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, right. So basically just what we would want to do is add to, to make this conditional a more compound thing that we want the A button to be pressed and something else to be true uh, or whatever. Uh, in order to prevent the button spamming and sort of the weird behavior that we saw last time. Okay, does that make sense? Um, I, I had some other thoughts about maybe a, a better way to uh, to handle the, the checking, uh, which I forget where we put that. Um, it was the flip card, that was pretty straightforward, this thing, um, which is, um, so we, um, For the, uh, the destruction part, we essentially recreated this array. Um, what we maybe could have done is, well, so each card, because we sort of had to do it this way, each card had it, has its own name, right, 1 through 12. And we could actually use the name of the thing as part of our operation, right, because we could just say, okay, check, you know, if it's, um, well, or, or here, this checklist value, when we added the card um, type to it, what we maybe could have also done was, in addition to, so what variables do we have for each card? We have card type and card state. We could have actually, actually added a card ID and just called it one, two, three, four, and so on. And then we could just look at that number and know which card we're looking at, okay? Where one is always the top left, two is the next one, and, and so on, right? That also might have actually simplified the, um, the creation part because, uh, where was that? Oh, sorry. This, this stuff over here right? Because we had 12 different card names, 
And what we could have just done was say, have them all be called card, but have each one have a separate number that's attached to it. And that's sort of functioning as its name, if you will. Um, so maybe a slightly, you know, would have improved this a little bit and, and also would have mean, meant that we wouldn't have quite so many variables in our list here to keep track of because we'd sort of be hiding some of them. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, the, I, I think that the major lessons that we wanted to kind of draw from this in terms of adapting it to, um, you know, what lessons can we use from this to adapt to the games you guys are gonna be are making? Um, I think probably the biggest thing is this idea of having uh, variables that keep track of the state that the game is currently in. Okay, so for example, let's um, let's actually go uh, or think about the uh, the side scroller stuff. Okay, how would you switch between side scrolling and top down? Okay, so there's a couple things that would have to happen to make the switch back and forth. So let me actually just start a new project so we can kind of talk through that. Um, oh. Okay, so what did we have to do in order to make side scrolling work? So first off, we needed the, we had all the tile map stuff, right? Okay, and uh, so we can set the tile map to, you know, whatever. So obviously if you had top down versus side scroller, you need two different tile maps for, for that, right? Um, and uh, so you would have to switch the tile map to the appropriate tile map at the appropriate time. Okay, the other thing that you would need to worry about is uh, your camera, you'd probably still want to follow your sprite. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but on the controller side, um, if you have move my sprite with move my sprite with buttons, okay, you can use this one for um, in, uh, in top down. Right. What would need to change about movement if you were doing in when in a side scrolling part? OK, so there'd be boundaries. And of course, that's going to be true no matter which like um, whether or not the side scroller, it's side scroller or top down. Right. You need to prevent the player from going off the edge of the tile map. OK. Um, but in terms of the movement itself, what, what's different about side scrolling versus top down? Yeah, there's no gravity in the top down mode, right? So, um, and also in the side scrolling mode, you can't move up. You can jump, but you can't just move up, okay? So the, the physics, if you will, is going to be slightly different between the two um, the two versions, right? And what you might want to do is, for example, um, like let's say we were making Mario 3, right, where you've got the map and then you've got the, um, when you select a level, you go into that level and it switches, is have a function that, you know, basically says start side scrolling and just changes all everything to be in side scroller mode and then have another function that switches everything back to being top-down mode. So you can condense, switch the tile map, blah, 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 and all those, the physics control stuff into a single function, and then you just call that function when you need it. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, oops. So um, one other thing, I guess, about the tile map uh, that I maybe wanted to mention because since almost everybody's doing something involving a tile map, um, is you do have um, a couple of other events that you can have. So how did we handle the death, um, the, the poison flowers in the game? It was with this guy, right? 
So if the player overlaps with, and then you select the, the, the tile for the poison flower uh, at a location, this location is a placeholder. Um, you don't have to actually use it. And in the case of the poison flowers, you didn't. You just said, if you touch a poison flower, you're dead, game over, right? Um, but you also have the hit wall uh, thing, okay, which would trigger any time you were hit, uh, overlapping or touching one of the, the tiles that you highlighted pink. Um, okay. Um, now, there's also one other thing you can do, which is, uh, for example, enemies. Let's say that you're in, like Mario, for example, right? Where should enemies spawn in a Mario level? Well, first off, in a given Mario level, they always sort of spawn in the same place, right? Um, for that given level. I don't really remember there being much randomness to it. Well, okay, there's maybe a little bit of randomness, but like the very first level of Mario 1, right, that first Goomba that walks towards you, right, is, um, you know exactly where it's going to be, okay? Um, so what you can do is place sprites on top of tiles, and they can either be tiles of a given um, coordinate or a random location, okay? Um, and uh, so what you can do if you wanted to place Goomba enemies, for example, is you know what the coordinates of where that you perhaps want to make that first enemy appear, right? And so you can do that. Uh, or you can have them, this would make it sort of randomized. So let, let's say, for example, you had, um, oh, I don't know. Um, you wanted everywhere there was a question mark block an enemy to appear. Okay, you probably don't want to actually do that, but just, let's just say, right? Well, there you go. Place it on top of a random question mark block, okay? Now, what you can't do is, and this is sort of the annoying thing, right? is it, let's say you have five question mark blocks and you want to put enemies on top of all of them. Well, if you use this random feature, then what's the problem? Theoretically, all five could end up in the same place, right? Now, that's probably not what you want to have happen, but when you're using randomness, like, you know, it could happen. So either you need to write down the, col the locations of eat all five, and spawn them one at a time on each guy, okay? Um, but you can also do this, which is, you remember how um, when we were working with the um, the uh, the cards in the card flipping game, we had get me an array of all cards, okay? And then we went through that array and did stuff with it. Well, I can also get array of all locations of particular uh, tiles, okay? So what I would do then, if the, let's say I wanted to spawn an enemy on top of every question mark, I'd first get an array of all question mark locations, and then for each one, I'd put one uh, an enemy on top of that one and move on to the next one in the list. Okay, so does that make sense? Um, and, um, right, okay, so a lot of the, the sort of array operations and other things that are in here, uh, we have at our disposal similarly to what we were dealing with the card stuff, okay? Um, now, you've also got, of course, a whole lot more stuff in here, right, which is to say, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, but the tile map does not have to be a fixed quantity once the game starts running, right? You can modify what is at a particular location, okay? And in fact, uh, well, and also modify whether or not it's solid, okay? So maybe a good example for Mario would be uh, the POW button. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, where you hit it and then like things that were uh, blocks turn into coins, or maybe that things w that were coins turn into blocks, right? And it kind of switches up how the tile map works, right? This would be the kind of way that you would use that is you'd, um, you'd have like, okay, 
the tiles that were you wanted to switch to being block, I mean coins, you'd need to have kind of a list of those, and you could go through one at a time using a loop to switch them from being solid blocks to being coins that could be collected, okay, uh, and vice versa. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? Um, uh, and uh, another way that you could use this would be, for example, like doors, right? So like, let's say you're doing like a Zelda style top-down game, right? In Zelda, there's lots of locked doors and you have to have a key in order to be able to use it. So what you could do is you could say, okay, um, is the tile to the left or whatever, or am I hitting uh, a tile that's a locked door? and check do i have a key or more than one key or more than zero keys i guess if so change the wall property and maybe even change the tile to make it look like it's an open door uh deduct one from my key count and now i can get through that door okay uh does that kind of make sense yeah um okay so yeah so you've got all of the, that stuff there and um, uh, you can also, well, let's see. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, the, this Boolean here, if uh, my sprite is hitting the wall uh, to left or top or right or bottom can be one way that you can uh, handle. So like, for example, uh, the question mark blocks in Mario under what conditions do they, like, change to uh, being whatever? Yeah, you got to hit them from the bottom, right? Uh, not from the side and not from the top. Um, hmm? Well, you can jump on them. They just don't, like... Oh, okay. So I guess like, yeah, in like maybe some of the, the newer Mario games where you can jump and then like slam, you can do it. Okay, but like in OG classic Mario, the only way you can trigger one of those coin blocks is from the underside. Okay, so this this Boolean would tell you if you've hit something from the underside. It doesn't tell you what you've hit. Okay, but it does allow you to say, okay, have I hit something? Which direction have I hit it from? And uh, there you go. Okay, now with the Goombas, for example, or the enemies, um, we kind of have that same problem that we would need to do, right? Because what happens if you intersect with the Goomba You from the top? It should squish the Goomba. Whereas if you touch it from the side, oops, it should damage you, right? Okay. And in the case of Mario, what was the, how did the damage work? If you were big Mario, it made you sh shrink to little Mario. But if you were little Mario and you touched an enemy, you died, right? Uh, and then there actually is some variation to this uh, in the Japanese versus American releases of some of these games. Um, so in Mario 3, for example, you can, uh, well, or Mario 1, um, what happens if you have fire Mario and you touch an enemy? You go back to big Mario. In the Japanese versions, you go back to little Mario. Okay. Uh, so you go directly from power up to little, not with that intermediary. Um, and obviously that would make the Japanese versions a little harder. Okay. Uh, that's something that they changed when they localized the stuff for American release, and um, um, it kind of makes sense, right? They they're knew the audience. Um, well, they, they also localized a whole lot of different things. So, for example, uh, what was the, the, the original Nintendo actually called in Japan? It wasn't called the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's called the Famicom, short for Family Computer. Okay, um, they marketed it completely different than they did uh, the NES here in the states. Um, 
and it was actually possible to get a keyboard for it and you could program in basic like they were really marketing it to japanese families as this is a family computer that you can play games on but you can also do lots of other stuff with it um it also they had an accessory uh well several accessories that you could get for it later uh, one of which was called the Famicom Disk System, and you could actually go to, like, kiosks or vending machines, frankly, and you could pop in your disk, and you could pay to have a copy of um, a game put on your disk, and it was cheaper to do that than it was to buy the cartridge. Um they didn't do that here in the States, right? And to some extent, you can imagine this would have been a train wreck. Now, in retrospect, I really wish they had, okay? Because, you know, like one of the things that I didn't realize when I was a kid is, so when, when I got my first Nintendo, which was probably in 87, maybe 88, I have to ask my parents, right? Somewhere in that, that, range um you know i would have been five six years old some something like that um the uh uh we also had a computer in the house it was a commodore 64 which i've talked ad nauseum about um but they basically use the same processor now there's a whole lot of other things that are different about the two systems but, like, if I could have gotten a hold, if I could have known when I was a kid that the Nintendo and the Commodore had a lot in common, and, hey, you can program these things, like, I don't know, maybe my, maybe I wouldn't be a math professor right now. Maybe I'd be a, you know, had founded Facebook or something. Well, yeah, that's true, right? Maybe I'd be would have done something really awesome right because i i you know finished high school in 2001 right so this is sort of the second the second age of the internet in the early 2000s when things like facebook were getting created right youtube those sorts of things i could have like made bank yeah so anyway but instead, I'm here teaching you guys, and I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, but yeah, my my career trajectory and and whatnot could have ended up being very different, um, if if that I mean if Nintendo, for example, had marketed this thing slightly differently to, to kids. Now they kind of saw the light, if you will, um, to some brief extent with the Super Nintendo. Okay, because what was one of the games? Did anybody ever have a Super Nintendo? You guys are maybe a little young for that. Okay. Um, did anybody ever play Mario Paint? So this game was one that really, I mean, it was widely lauded, but it also won over parents that, hey, this machine, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but you can also learn a lot with it, too. So it was a game where basically you could write songs. It like the game came with a little mouse that you'd plug into one of the controller ports and um, you could write songs and you could make art and you can animate them. And then you could put the song with the animation and make like little creations or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was really cool. Um, but, you know, they could have, if they had marketed things differently, I think they might've, ironically actually had more success uh, than instead of marketing it purely as an entertainment device. So, yeah. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Sam. So I think it's more so that they weren't making it harder for the Japanese. They were making it easier for the Americans. I, I think it was the other way around, right? It is, right? And... Uh, you know, particularly with, um, you know, more arcade style games or, or things. Um, I, I think there's a different, um, 
sort of American audiences and Japanese audiences, their sort of respect for skill in a game and practice and stuff is just different. The way, like, uh, yeah. So, so I think what what they did was they they actually just made it easier for the American release. Um, and that's not the only, I think, example of of some changes that they make in the localization process uh, to tailor it to the to the to the, um, to the market uh, that it's going to. Of course, they also had to do language changes and stuff. But um, yeah, so yeah, um, okay. So I, I guess just to get back to what are the salient lessons here for. Um, for now that we're diving into our our own stuff right game state variables can be helpful right kind of depends on how you're gonna what kind of game you're gonna be making um and um tile maps are going to be really heavily used i think by no matter what game you do even if you're doing like something like a space shooter right what's the advantage of maybe throwing a tile map in there Well, yeah, it might be an easy way to place enemies, but also, yeah, exactly. So, like, I mean, yeah, you might have some levels where you're just flying in empty space, but maybe, like, you're also flying above a moon, you know, attacking the moon base of the whatever dudes or whatever, and then you could have a tile map for that. Uh, and you could use the tile map to place some enemies. Um, and, of course, in a space shooter, well, or in Mario, for that matter, Right, not every enemy has to move. Okay, um, so like in Mario, there's enemies like the the piranha plants that come out of the pipes. Right, they move. Well, okay, I guess those sort of move, but but they can't move left and right. Right, they're sort of fixed in that particular location. Um, are there any other enemies that don't actually move besides the those? And I mean, yeah, they shoot fireballs, right? Or some of them do. Um, can't think of any others. Um, I mean, if you go Mario two, Mario three, right? Obviously, things things might be different. So, um, yeah. Um, I think we talked about the fireball, how you would do stuff, projectiles like that. Okay. Um, and and actually, I think at least one person is going to be using the darts extension, uh, which gets you kind of parabolic arc kind of stuff. Um, and let's see what's there actually. Uh, so you can throw darts and uh, trace them, and you could control the dart with arrow keys. So that's actually kind of cool. Uh, you could control the, you know, control the the projectile while it's in flight. Um, this may be, let's see, a good game that does that. Is any, did anybody ever play Unreal Tournament? It's a PC game. Um, no. Um, well, what about? Let's see. What about Mario? Um, Mario that's on the Switch. Yeah, Mario Odyssey or. Um, some of the, the, the newer ones. Is, um, so like in Mario Odyssey, there were some places where you could like, if you did the, the whole like possess another creature thing and that was a bullet bill, you could like fly around, right? Um, in Unreal Tournament, there was a weapon you could get called the Redeemer, uh, which was like this giant missile of doom and you could fly it around. And uh, so Unreal Tournament was like, uh, you played well. The Redeemer only ever got uh, placed in game in maps that were for like capture the flag mode, but like you could fly the Redeemer from wherever you found it, and like, uh, like basically just blow up an entire base worth of enemy uh, of your your opponents. It was really really kind of cool. Um, but what it did was you could fly it around, uh, but to kind of make it sort of even uh you, the redeemer could be shot down okay by enemies uh and second your player just sat there because you were controlling it so if some other player stumbled upon you and like shotgun to the face you 
then you're gone and the redeemer just blows up wherever it was. Um, yeah. And, and interestingly enough, so why did it, do you know, anybody know why they called it the redeemer? Well, you guys have never played the game. So no, um, the, the developers of it, uh, Epic games who were in North Carolina, uh, basically one of the guys was driving to work and I guess the way he drove to work, he always passed a church and the church was called the church of the redeemer. And he saw the sign and was like, perfect. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I remember back when they were developing and talking about it, he actually posted a picture of the, the church's like street sign thing that has, you know, where they, they can put the letters on it to make it say whatever they want. Uh, and it's just sort of like, oh, okay, that's, that's funny. So, uh, yeah, okay. So anyway, the dart thing might be uh, useful for uh, uh, ballistic physics, um, you know, particularly if you're trying to do something like Zelda where you've got arrows. Um, although probably for for uh, Zelda, if you're doing it top down style, I'm not sure you would actually need to use this because if you're in top down mode, there's really no gravity affecting your thing. Right. I think this would be really, um, really much more um, useful in side scrolling, although the idea of being able to control the arrow, that's not something I think Zelda ever did. Right. Where you could have like a magic arrow that you could control its flight. Um, that'd be kind of cool, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess that haven't some of the Assassin's Creed games done that or like when you. I mean, I've been playing a lot of Assassin's Creed Odyssey lately to try and finish it. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, it's not, like, super controllable in the sense that you can't turn it around, but you can, like, if you've targeted, you know, that polymark that you want to just put one through his head, and he starts walking all of a sudden, then you're like, oh, crap, and you've got to kind of bend the trajectory to, to hit him in the head. Um, you've got a little bit of control over that. So, um, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so I think probably at about this point we can kind of stop the stream, and I maybe want to just kind of talk with everybody about what you guys are thinking, working on, that sort of thing. Um, so any any kind of questions for the good of the order? And just Sure. Okay, so the transition. Um, well, the first thing you would need to change the tile map, right, uh, to the top down version. Okay, the second would be you'd need to change the movement controls uh, so that uh, gravity is no longer a factor. Okay, um, and other than those two things, I'm not really sure what else would necessarily need to be changed. Um, well, okay, actually, uh, probably the art for your player, too, right? Because if you're going top down, you, your player shouldn't look the same as if it... Um, now, it's still the same sprite, it's just which image you're attaching to it rather than uh, that. Yeah, so probably those three things, for sure. Um, now, if we think about, like, Mario, for example, um, you could actually add sort of an intermediary in between the two things, like a cutscene almost, where like maybe it says like World 1-1 one, one or whatever, and then you see the new tile map. Um, that's kind of more of an artistic decision, obviously. Um, but I think at minimum, those would be the things you'd have to do is change the tile map, okay? And that really is the same as like uh, in the, the monkey uh, game that we did where you change the tile map from one level to the next, it just so happened that those were both side-scrolling levels, right? So that part is just kind of the same thing. Just change the tile map. Um, also change the gravity. And then um, make sure that you're putting the player in the correct place on the tile map, right? Uh, and whatever the correct place is just depends on how you've designed your tile map. Um, yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And anything beyond that is going to be more of a, I think, a, a, a specific case-by-case -case kind of thing. Yeah. I think the funny part was when you were um, about using aspects that we didn't do. Mm. Thank you, because I meant to 
bring this up. Yes. Okay. So for the purposes of this, um, there are, you know, the art assets, um, there's really not a whole lot you've got in the sound department. So r really it's art is the only thing that you've got control over. Okay. Uh, you can use anything that's already built in. Okay. Without attribution, it's already there. Okay. Uh, you can obviously use anything you create yourself. Okay. Or modify from the existing content without attribution. Um, but what about using stuff that other people have made either in other games on here or things that you get out, go out and find on the internet? Okay. So in general, I guess two things, you shouldn't use commercial content. Okay. So don't use Mario brothers art. Right. You can make it kind of look sort of like Mario and be kind of inspired by Mario, but don't actually use copyrighted material in that sense. Okay. Um, and, uh, but that said, if there's something that people have created and shared out there, and there's lots of pixel art out there, a lot of people post this stuff with sort of creative commons or like they're okay with people using it. That's fine with attribution, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so in the same way that you would have like a works cited page in a paper, right? You kind of need to, to kind of keep track of a bibliography, if you will, of if you've used other people's things or if you've been heavily inspired by other people's work. So for example, um, let's say that we're trying to figure out some kind of very specific mechanic and trying to figure out what would be a good way to do it. And we find somebody else's project on here that does it in a really clever way. Well, make code is designed with the intent that you can see inside everybody's game, right? If I choose to share my project, not only can everybody play it, but they can also look inside and see how did I do it, right? Which is cool. Um, and, uh, right, and so if you do look inside and see a clever way of doing something, that inspires you, just credit it. It's no big deal, right? Um, you know, credit it, put the, put the link to it. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is kind of, a, you know, intellectual property writ large. Um, you know, in the game development world, right, obviously you would only use assets that you had rights to either because they were freely available or you had paid for the rights to them. Um, or they were things you made yourself, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, it's not. I mean, this isn't rocket science, guys, right? You just don't be a don't be a jerk. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, good question on the the intellectual property part. Um, and since since we can't actually put in like MP3s of music in this or our own recorded sound effects, that we don't really have to worry about because the and I think they've deliberately limited it. The, the sound part of this, partly to get around those issues. Yeah. The music? <sighs> uh, no. Okay. And the reason is because there's a lot of like, they've essentially written their own packages, right? And you would have to load those packages in with a Jupyter Notebook, but they're not designed for outside this environment. So no, I don't think it would, you can't just copy and paste it in, um, which is unfortunate, right? Um, but, you know, say la vie. Uh, that would be kind of nice if you could do something like that. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Um, what have you used Jupyter Notebooks in? Chemistry? Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, Jupyter is, Jupyter Notebooks, I think, uh, they've started using quite a lot in physics and some of the chemistry, like, lab classes as just sort of a self-contained way to actually just get some stuff done without having to install a whole bunch of crap. And, you know, it, it um, yeah. So, anyway. Um, okay, other kind of questions for the good of the order? No? Do you have like a virtual audio knowledge that you can use? Is there a video that you'd like to have in here for us? 
Oh, goodness. Not off the top of my head. Right. No. Um, although there is one thing. Um, I'll have to go back and dig around for it um, and remember where I put it. Uh, so you guys know like the Humble Store or Humble Bundle or whatever, right? Well, there was something, um, and this was years and years ago, and I, I'd forgotten about it until you just said something. Um, one of the deals or whatever that they had was like 20 bucks for just like a crap ton of pixel art. And so I bought this crap ton of pixel art. Now, it also has some more stuff in there. So it's got like some MP3 music that you could use in games. Now, obviously, we can't use those in make code. But um, so let me find where I put all that and just upload the whole shooting match to Canvas. And then you guys can have at it. Um, I think that's that's probably fair. Uh, in particular, um, one of the things, and I, I remember using this set, particular set of art quite extensively, was um, in um, in well, okay. So Make Code hasn't been around for a super long time. I've only been using it, I think, now for teaching for a couple of years. Um, but when I first started teaching CS and doing things like this, we used Scratch instead. Okay. In many ways, it's similar. In many ways, it's different. Um, and uh, I remember writing, I wanted to write um, a final exam question. Um, and one of the, uh, the over scratch. And what I did was um, I made it so that I made a game, a real simple game, and then deliberately introduced bugs and then shared with everybody the broken version and said, here's what it's supposed to do, but obviously if you play it, you'll see that it doesn't qu correctly do that. Find and fix the bug so that it, it performs as intended. And for one of the classes, because I wanted to make these games kind of look somewhat like they were real things and not just super janky. I, I did basically a simple space shooter uh, and I used some of the pixel art spaceships that I that were inside this pile of pixel art. Um, yeah, so thanks for the reminder. I will go uh, after after class this afternoon. I'll, I'll find where I put those and then upload it all to Canvas. And then you guys can have at it. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let me kill the stream, and I guess we can just uh, kind of talk a little bit about, or collectively, about what everybody's thinking. Um, so, see you next time.